while he makes his way to the stage, a few things about Tony here. Tony is the celebrated host of the globally renowned Chowder That Matters, of course, sponsored by RBC. This show has global reach and is currently ranked in the top 1% of the most popular podcasts worldwide. Welcome, Tony, and thank you so much for sharing your Chowder That Matters platform with our Sheridan community today. So I was thinking about what could I possibly say to an institution that has so many young, brilliant, and passionate people. And I just walked in here, you could just feel the energy of this place, it's Sheridan. But as I was driving up, interesting enough, I heard a song that was 55 years old, Jumping Jack Flash, Rolling Stones. And the reason I heard it, is they just announced that they're gonna do another tour. And I remember Jagger saying in his lifetime, I'll never be a 40 year old rock and roller and they're still reinventing themselves. But the first line in that song is I was in a crossfire hurricane. I was born in a crossfire hurricane. They talked about 1968 when the world was, they thought was impossible. They thought that it might not survive. And I think about today and I think about the crossfire hurricane we're all in, economic uncertainty, there's war, inflation that's happening, AI could be coming to take our jobs, a climate, so many things that we got to deal with that are headwinds. And really what has happened is in our watch and in your watches, you're going to take on Canada, that really it's going to be divided into two things. People that make things happen, that do extraordinary things because this technology is going to open up such opportunities for you or there's gonna be people that sadly just watch and wonder what happened. I wonder if that's the switch. As a dad, I always wonder, could I just turn a switch on so suddenly eyes would shine and, and the heartbeat would just roar with intensity and passion? Or is it just something that you're born with? And today that's what I'm gonna explore because I have somebody who switches on. This person is a curator, he's a creator, He's a facilitator, he's a motivator, involved in so many different lanes in life. He does it with an appetite, he does it with humility, he does it with empathy, he does it with extraordinary love for his parents. His name is Jesse Jones, and I think he deserves one hell of a round of applause. Jesse, come on up. This is Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. If I just met you for the first time, we're at a coffee shop and we sat down, and I'm just seeing you today. I know you greet everybody, you look everybody in the <laughs> eye. And I just said, so what do you do for a living? How would you describe what you do in a couple of sentences? I just like to connect people. I like to connect worlds. I like to connect opportunities. Through the journey, it's it's kind of been that that peak that I've gotten to. When I've looked at all the things that I'm able to do every day, that's the thread. The thread is always like, how how are we bringing people together? How are we how are we creating understanding? You know, across worlds and uh, yeah, I would so, say I would say the connecting worlds thing. So this age group, I just read a study that said, as connected as they are with the world within arms reach of desire. They're also the loneliest. So tell me about how your connections work to facilitate sort of face-to-face -face conversation and putting the human back in humanity. I feel like we're in a time where um, we're not as interested as we could be in each other. And I feel like if we were a little bit more interested in each other, you know, the pathway is there. And I think whether it's in the marketing or branding work that we do in the consulting we do with clients, if I'm doing something in the media, uh, it, it's really always bringing people together and bringing understanding together. And I think the more of that we have, the less friction we'll have. You know, I see this room right here. All, all of these people have uh, consciously decided to come here and listen to us speak, you know. That's part of it. We need to come together, have more conversations like the ones you're having on your podcast. So I see anybody on social media, very often the validation is how many likes or shares oh, or yeah, comments. Sure. And what it sounds like from you is your validation for connecting is more from the heart. 
that the fact that it's it's less about what's in it for me and maybe what's what's in it for the people we're connecting to or the space that we're in? Yeah, I think um, when that became my motivation, but I'm genuinely interested in the people that I'm engaging with, you know, like I'm genuinely interested in the person at the checkout when I'm, I'm ringing the groceries through. There's real power in recognition. Like if you see somebody, you know, I think you tie it back to, uh, you, you said in the intro how important my parents were to my upbringing. I know we're going to get into that, but there was a real recognition that, you know, I got from them to say, what you're thinking in your head is going to be possible for you. That's a game changer. You know, when someone sees you and they recognize you and they say you have the power to achieve the things that you have in your head. That doesn't just have to come from a parent. That could come from someone who you just meet right here and who sees you and says, hey, keep going at that. As you're listening to this, I want you to internalize some of it because I just think sometimes we just skip over things. But there's always somebody in your life that sees something in you that others hadn't. And I think when you pay attention to that and you realize that, I think that's a special time. And I want to go back to your childhood. Grew up in Sudbury. Yeah, so anybody here from Sudbury, Ontario? That's that's how it always is when I ask. Yeah. And so, then people look at me and they go, Sudbury? Well, they, they tore down the, the giant nickel and they've got a statue of Jesse there now. <laughs> no, um, no, no. So no. You're, you're growing up in Sudbury and your parents... Jamaican family. Jamaican in Sudbury family. In the early 80s. And if that isn't enough to uh, turn things around, they get involved in theater. Yeah, that's how, the, that's how Jones & Jones, the, the business I'm running today... Uh, started foundation was in creating experiences. They met in the theater back, back in Jamaica and were like, you know, trained high up in the theater. And then my mother came here to, to University of Windsor, studied, um, theater, went back to Jamaica. They met, they came up to Sudbury. My dad was in pharmaceuticals and they started Jones and Jones up there with the purpose of connecting to diverse audiences, connecting institutions to the experiences that matter within multicultural audiences. And what I found fascinating when I was researching <clears throat> Jesse's childhood, this family, these Jamaicans, they started putting on these theater productions and you've heard about Take Your Kid to Work Day. You probably all got dragged in for one day. Well, they used to bring Jesse into the theater uh, as it was happening. And then when it was time for his bedtime, I think you were four years old, they would just take the coats that were piled up and put you on it. And you call that one of the most positive experiences of your life. Yeah, I think it was the most beautiful thing they could have done because I don't think we put enough um, emphasis on the power of art in our lives, uh, arts and culture. Um, you started off the podcast talking about Mick Jagger. Music and film are the things that move us I don't care what it is we do, you know, by day, but we're moved by arts. Those are the things that kind of make us feel things, right? Give us texture. And so for me to grow up in a family that understood how to marry art and commerce and create a life around that, which has now evolved into marketing, branding, content. We mm. see where the world is going now. It's going right back to that. To be sleeping backstage at some of these large productions and having the hustle and bustle going on around while I'm, I feel like that was, there's some osmosis happening there that was kind of just softly getting into my system that would say like, this is a pathway, you know? The, the, there are some learnings here in terms of creating something from the ground up, creating experiences that matter to community, being able to kind of build the 360 plan around it. I, I think falling asleep there was probably the first bit of school I yeah. ever had. Many of the people I've interviewed talk about Sheena Russell, who now runs one of the top female-led independent uh, food companies. And my dad used to take me to the bakery and I'd come home covered in flour. You know, Brian Baumler, my dad owned a sheet metal place. And I'd go back and I'd start playing with the metal. And now he's, you know, obviously a TV personality. When did your mom look you in the eye and say, you could be prime minister? There's no ceiling, Jesse. Did you believe it then? Or when did you realize that which, that seed she planted in you would just grow like wildfire? It's not lost on me, the journey that 
has me sitting with you right now on this stage. I mean, you know, coming from parents who immigrated here, left a complete world that they know to come here to start something new, create opportunity. In order for them to do that, my father's siblings had to be here before them to kind of lay some foundation, to let them know where to come. To, like, there's just all this stuff that's happened before. And I think I think my mother, when I remember the conversation. She said, look, you're from here. You are born here. So this entire country is, is yours to embody, to feel like it, it is yours. You're Canadian. You... And I just, I think that came from the recognition of what it took to get here and that as a born Canadian that, you know, I should be able to see whatever it is uh, I want to achieve. And I think that's, I think, I think it was that confirmation, whether that comes from a mother, whether that comes from a friend, whether that comes from a coworker, whether that comes from someone we come into contact with, confirmation that you can do is, I think, a very important thing. I would argue most parents would say that because that's what parents are supposed to say. But I think there was a difference here. And the difference with you is you could have taken that two ways. You could have taken it, look at all the sacrifices your dad's <coughs> siblings did and we've done to bring you to Canada, so do something with your life. Or you could have taken it as, you've taken me this far, now I'm gonna start blazing my own trail. And one of the reasons we're doing this podcast today is, is that something you're born with? Or is that something that, is that a belief system that we can all have that destiny is a matter of choice, not chance? I believe we're all born with things that move us, but we're not all told to follow those things. And I think that's what we're battling with every day is like, you know, you have these, these ideas in your head of things you'd like to do. You, you, you might even have had the opportunity to do some of those things and been lit up by them. But then at some point, someone says, yeah, but how are you going to make a living doing that? I saw my parents real time making a life around their passions, around their ability to connect people and connect experiences to them that matter. So I've always been a believer that if there's an idea that comes into your head or there is something that you do that lights you up and makes you feel alive, that you should commit time to that. You know, when it's time to get up and really get the, the, the dirty work done, you're moved by your connection to what you're doing. Your parents, they leave Sudbury, they moved to Scarborough, and I was quite moved when you talked about the fact that multicultural didn't exist where you grew up. We were one human race, and we lived and played and socialized and broke bread together. And I said earlier, you know, I talked about how the roots of, of, of Jones and Jones and what we do even today, back then it was all about understanding the experiences of people and diverse audiences. This is back in the 80s. 2020 came around recently and we kind of all had this awakening post COVID. But growing up, it wasn't about, oh, this person. I mean, you knew where they were from, right? You knew the, the different backgrounds and, and, and things, but it wasn't like this big production around it, right? It was more like, that's Justice. That's Rodney. This is Jesse. And when I go to Justice House, I, I, I get to try different food than I have at my place. And it, it was really just an authentic community. I think where we're getting lost now is is we're we're segmenting too much we're not as interested as we need to be across all of that so, so who's forcing this segmentation on us because i couldn't agree more that it seems like we got to be left right east west male female who's creating this out there that that's saying that this is what's right versus saying why can't we have the neighborhood you grow up with saying i kind of like going to jesse's house because i've never tried that Put your hand up if you've heard the uh, acronym BIPOC, right? So for me, I've always had an issue with that, that acronym because by nature, we're kind of still segmenting everybody uh, within this. We're saying that I don't really have the time or the headspace to understand each of these areas. So I'm going to lump them together into one and say, here, I think we just need to stay interested in who's around us and who's making up our communities because then you won't actually need to segment. You'll just 
be speaking to the people who make up the communities you're part of. It might take a little bit of tailoring, but what doesn't take work? Younger generations aren't calling each other by, by acronyms. They're just existing with each other, right? So the future is not using these acronyms that us adults are using. <laughs> like they're just existing, you know? So what happens when they're in leadership? What are we going to do with those acronyms that they don't even use? I'm concerned that social media uses data to herd you into a like-minded <laughs> castle with like-minded people validating like-minded content. And what was originally... Uh, you might have had a slight bias towards starts getting cemented in. So it might not be the young people right now, but I think data can be highly manipulative in convincing you that your side is right and the other side is wrong. And that doesn't have to be just with ethnicity. <clears throat> that can be with it just about anything. If we come back, we might have some time. I, yeah. I want to talk about, because the circumstances, you lose Andrew Gale and Lamont Saunders, if I'm pronouncing the name, they both... When you're fairly young, it's the first time you experience people leaving you. Who were they? Why did they matter to you? And did that change you as a character, just in terms of your appreciation of life and time? I think when you lose some friends who are close to you in, in, in those high school, university kind of formative years, you can't help but realize like, oh, okay, you know, time is finite. You have one of your closest friends and then you don't have them and you're young still. So like you're not thinking that that's when that should be happening. But um, I do remember it inspiring me to I, I started to feel very lucky for every next day, every next level, every next opportunity. Yes, things aren't always perfect. And, you know, it's a it's a struggle to make your dreams come true. But uh that was when I first started to go, huh, this isn't forever and it can end. Another interesting twist to your story is, you know, these parents, they bring you to the theater. They get you on stage when you're a young age. They're creating their own destiny with content. They're entrepreneurs. They've made two big moves in their life. And yet when it's your time to go to university, they're encouraging you to go for security. Maybe she'd be a lawyer, an accountant. And I think you said, maybe I'll be an entertainment lawyer. So at least it was as close as you could get yeah. to maybe that heart. Yeah. But why is it that sometimes the trailblazers in our life, and I'll go back to your dad's siblings even, they machete their way through. They have so much pride in what they're doing. They're, it's not even monetary success. They're, they're fashioning their own creativity. But when it comes to the, their son, who's got so much positivity, they want to you go down a lane that they had to believe they knew it wasn't right for you. Well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, when you come from a, you know, multicultural background, your parents want you to be successful. Even if you're seeing them follow their thing, it's that coddling of, of their, their young person. They want to say, go to these professions that are generally, I see faces in the audience nodding, right? Because if you come from, you know, especially if your parents immigrated here, where they come from, the lawyers and the doctors and, uh, you know, those those professions, teachers. I, I come from a family of teachers. So I found that really interesting, you know, because I'm seeing them every day following their passion and actually making a business out of it and having direct impact on people. Yet they're saying, well, you know, you should. So I, I did write the LSAT like a ton of times and it kicked my butt. Like, I, I don't think I did very well. But the interesting thing now is that as I run Jones and Jones as an agency, you know, I'm reading through these contracts and reading. And then if I'm doing anything in the media, I'm getting these contracts. Obviously, entertainment lawyers are are working on them, but I'm learning. I know about them. I know what to ask. I know what pieces to bring in. So it's just funny. But parents are just trying to do the best that they can. So what advice do you give the people in the audience so that there's a meeting of minds between young people, as you said earlier on, your passion, the superpowers that you have, and it's not necessarily the career that they feel the people that have influence on you, you're ordained for. That's a tough one. Um, and I think, you know, at any given time in our lives, we're going to have to like take a stand on something and, and carve our own path. At the end of the day, if you wake up every day and you're lit up for what it is you're going to do, then I think beautiful. But you have to make a choice at some point, you know, is it this or is it this? And it can be this and then it can be that. 
it doesn't have to be this forever. It can be this for now. And then it can be this leading to this, which leads to this. So I think it's just how we look at it. So I'll take two moves in your chessboard. You, we, you go off to the University of Ottawa, you graduate, you get a great job at Timex. And when I first read that, Timex, Jesse Jones, yeah. turns out you, they give you the hot brands. They're trying to reinvent their business. I have to believe you're as far away from what they think they're looking for. Yet you come in there and you put your cultural stamp on it, your whole concept of nuancing and understanding, and you become a rock star there. I mean, they, you get promoted very quickly. They're just celebrating the fact that, that this might be the type of talent they need in the future. But while you're there and you're starting to make a good salary, you're probably getting yourself a nice car, great sneaks, and you decide to start doing a side hustle. I'm curious because a lot of people start getting down a lane and even though they're still looking over on each side wondering and there's still an itch out there, they stay in that lane. You don't. You step off that lane at night after you've worked a full day and start putting together the consulting business. Why? I was lucky enough to see two people that decided to take their destiny in their own hands and create. And that was always in me. So I knew that at some point, it would be a, a road I followed. I just didn't know when. But like I said, there's chapters, right? I think life is about chapters. Life is about stages. And the only thing that continues to happen is change. So for me, those were really great opportunities to, to learn, right? I was now getting into marketing for a large company that was international. I was getting to travel. I was getting to meet people in different parts of the world. I was getting to learn about product. I got to, you know, meet with the big retailers and understand like, how does that watch get all the way from here to the showcase? How do they get selected? How do you price those things? Like, how do you budget all of that? Like, these are all these things that I was learning that we're just, you know, you ever seen those movies where the guy opens up the jacket? He's like, hey, what do you want? I've got this. I've got this. It was just building this toolkit. And so, yeah, I knew that one day the entrepreneurial side would come, but uh, I didn't know when. And this was part of the toolkit. So, again, we're, a lot of people in this audience are students. What advice can you give to them that no matter where they are in life, whether they happen to be working at this job or in transit, uh, at a park that they see beyond the moment yeah. and start finding ways to build their toolbox. Yeah, it's a toolkit. Everything is a toolkit. You know, I think um, all the meetings you have, the people that you meet every day, the people you come into contact, I, it's all a toolkit. Not necessarily like a toolkit to like make me better or what. It's just more like the learnings are there. The learnings are there. And the people that you're meeting in class here and it, those people are going to go off and do different things. And as a greater community, you know, you'd be amazed at 10 years later what happens, you know. So I try not to get stuck on how I feel in like a moment because I know that this moment will pass. And that's even on the big moments like where you're completely ecstatic because you feel like you really hit it. It's going to pass. That's just the reality. So I try to to stay um, even uh, about it and realize like, yeah, this stage is great. What am I meant to learn from this? What am I meant to learn from this interaction? And then I take that with me to the next thing, you know? So you're at Timex, you're doing this consulting business on the side, you decide to go in it full, full on. Time. Full time. Full time. What did you learn keeping that business alive? Because while you were trying to get it going, you needed to cash. From what I understand, you were a courier. Yeah. So, so, so check this out. Let me like, I've never actually said this publicly, but I'm, I'm in this, this brand management job. I'm in my twenties. Uh, I, I went to school for communications and marketing. I decided to go freelance and, and build my personal brand while I'm at Timex. I'm going to do meetings in places like Yorkville and all these, you know, I'm meeting people and I'm pitching this brand. And then I decide, okay, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. And then I'm like, oh, you actually need some clients. You need some, you need to be busy. How are you going to do this? And so I'm getting on the phone and I'm calling people and I'm saying, Hey, I'm open for business. This is what I do. Here's what I consult on. But in the meantime, you need cash flow. And I just started thinking like, what can I do as I do this? 
you know, and build this up. This was before, you know, Uber and Uber Eats and stuff. But I'm like, okay, let's do courier. You get cash every week and you move things around the city. So I call this company and I say, hey, how can I? uh," And then boom, I'm doing this. And so I'm doing courier and then getting back to my apartment to take calls to pitch my consultancy. Okay, I remember one time uh, I got out of delivering something to someplace in Yorkville and I ended up chatting with the, the lady who was signing. She goes, I've seen you here a couple of times. She's like, what do you, you know, what's your story? I don't know why she asked me that, but I told her, I said, well, um, it's my second week on this and I'm, I'm starting up my, my business but I needed to kind of get things going. So I'm doing this. And she goes, she, she just stared at me for about five minutes. And then she started telling me about her dream, which then kind of said to me like, wow, she goes, you know, I've wanted to do X, Y, Z. And she's just like, how do you, you know, how do you feel about doing this? And I said, I'm terrified to be honest. Like I'm, I'm pretty scared. And, and it was just that exchange with her that actually gave me more motivation to keep to keep doing it. I was in that for about two months. But the, the, the point is that what I was going to was worth it for me to do that. The other learning too that I had is many times I would go into a building to have them sign for this package and they wouldn't even make eye contact with me. You know what I mean? And, and, and two months later or two months before that, I would have been in those spaces meeting with people and clients while I was at my, my brand job. So it was kind of funny. I felt like I was playing this, like this other role. I was in, I was moving through places I had been before, but in a different costume and the people were treating me differently. And I think that experience was, would always tell me, it said, you have to see people, man. Like, don't stop seeing people, you know, don't treat them differently because of whatever, see them because you don't know the story. That was, again, part of the toolbox. It was part of the journey. It was part of the formation that I take with me now, whether I'm in a client meeting or I'm on set doing something. It's just like, you know, we all matter. <laughs> you know, we, we really do. And I think you can stay interested because you never know what you can like spark. Now, I wonder how many I'll even look to the people in the audience. You go through life and Jesse stores this stuff. He bottles it. He treasures it, mashes it up with other things have happened to him to, you know, to give you what I call this sort of old soul. But I want to now get to important, a really important part of the story, a sad part of the story. You're doing this business for eight years. You're helping your parents out with Jones and Jones. You're, You're really making this thing happen, but your mentor, your North star, uh, your hero, your mom passes away. Yeah. Again, you look at this and say, but she hasn't stopped putting footsteps in front of for me to follow. So t- just share with us that time in your life and why you feel that even with something like that, there's a silver lining, there's something to take away that was a good thing. She passed away December, 2020. So you have the world changing, COVID is happening. And uh, she was diagnosed with brain cancer. And so, you know, that's, you know, one of those things where you have a limited amount of time my brother uh, and I just revamped our entire lives for that year and a half. We were, you know, and then and then also she has the family business. We have the family business. So she was leading that. So my consultancy now and I step in, I merge everything. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that has become now. But in that time, you have to do all of that. You're merging clients, you're merging experiences, you're overseeing healthcare with mom and and, and my brother and I were on either side of her. She took her, her final breath in our family, in the family home. But what I realized- You were almost on a Zoom call. I was supposed to be in the office on a Zoom call at 8 p.m. And she passed away, you know, just after like nine, between that nine See, and 10 o'clock hour. It must have been the greatest gift that you were with her. I think if we can, if we can part there for a moment, uh, we all have um, something inside of us that tells us what we should be doing. We all have it. Good chunk of us in this room ignore it many times, right? Uh, for, for, For whatever reason, that could be work, not work, whatever. But that night, I'm so glad I did that because 
you hear stories about when you lose someone and you being in that room when that happens. And I can only say that there is something that happens and it's something you can't explain. But I can honestly say that one of the most tragic moments, I think for me to this date, and one of the most beautiful moments happened in that at the same time. And I say beautiful because I was able to be there. She was there when I was able to come into this world and I was there when she transitioned from it. And there was this exchange of energy that I feel happened in that moment. And I'm glad that I listened to my gut. It was the moment where I said, continue to listen to your gut because wow, like, <laughs> you know, so what, what, what are we missing out on when we're not listening to that gut? Um, I'm glad I didn't miss out on that. But it, it was a real game changer for me. Was, also, what happened is I realized that life is not guaranteed. We can have things, we can get news tomorrow that changes the course of everything. And so after that, I started saying to myself, well, if I get news tomorrow that would change the course of my life, am I happy with like, am I into the contribution I'm making? Am I into the what I'm doing now, would I keep doing it for that year and a half if they told me that's what I had? That's what I, I kind of lead my decision making with. So I want to now take me to the next morning because the Toronto Star reaches out for context because your, your mother has made an impact in Canada. It's probably the last thing you want to do is to talk to a newspaper. But at the same time, you realize this is part of her legacy. So just share a little bit about that story of the following morning. The whole story of like everybody's got an experience. Every one of us in this room had an upbringing and had an experience. And if you look, there are all these pebbles that are there. Everyone has a path. But I find it interesting that that creating was a part of my path. Like I, I, I literally was born kind of in this world of, of theater and production. Um, and entertainment, but just the idea that there's this phrase that says, I'm, I'm going to start it and hopefully some people in the audience can finish it. They say the show must write. I was sleeping on these, these jackets under the table in, in these theater experiences. And that's the phrase that it says. And I don't mean that to say, well, hey, mom passed, so get back to it. But when the Toronto Star is calling and they want to they want to talk about the contribution, I had to put a pause on the tears. I had to put a pause. Well, I actually remember shedding some during that talk, but I had to make sure that the story got right. And so to know that there's like this weight on you hours after she's passed, but you're getting a phone call to something that's going to be part of history. You know, it's going to be there telling her story and it just felt to me like and, and I'm in the office that has the family business sign on the front there was this energy to say you know what you you have to step into this and you have to carry that torch and you have to tell that story it was also at a time where there was this big awakening in in community you know in terms of culture you're talking 2020 right that was a big year for all of us I think when there are things that matter to you, you'll find a way. It's important for us to find what matters to us so we can find our way. You know, uh, that's why I believe so, so much on centering your life around the things that light you up. When we return, more gems from Jesse Jones. My three takeaways, and then I invite two special guests. First, Sherry Wuhan. She's the AVP of Human Development and Potential from Sheridan College, as she passionately talks about how education must change to focus on the whole person. And the Jody Wright from RBC to join the show to talk about why youth matters. It's Tony Chapman from Chatter That Matters. I asked Canadians about their money matters. We talked debt, inflation, interest rates, and many were worried and some felt they could lose everything. In response, RBC has created My Money Matters. It's a site where you gain financial knowledge. You learn how to manage debt, reduce stress. There's even tools and apps to help you deal with the realities of today. Visit rbc.com slash money matters. Your financial well-being matters to you and to RBC. 
I really do believe that no matter where we come from, there are some specific tenants we all want to hang on to and we all want to feel. I'm really in the space now of connecting worlds, connecting people. What I want to wake up every day and do through work in a number of different ways. My ultimate calling, I think, is to bring people together. Mm. It's what I get great joy out of. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. My guest today is Jesse Jones. He's a change maker, a content creator, and someone who radiates positivity. And we're taping this session live at Sheridan College. Let's talk a little bit about Jesse Jones today and host of The Bachelor, motivational speaker. He spoke at Yale University, doing a lot of different things. What I am so impressed with is you're sort of following this young generation that doesn't just want to sing for the supper, they want to own the diner. You're creating your own product. You're creating your own content, as opposed to just saying, I'm going to go to a client and work for them. Talk to the audience about the difference between, I want Jesse Jones as a host of The Bachelor in Paradise because he's a good-looking, cool guy, versus (laughs) I want to be Jesse Jones who does a content series for a client that I own and have creative control. How do you balance both? And how do you make sure both bring you passion? Right now, I mean, we talked about the birth of Jones & Jones as a company that my parents started and the roots of it being in creating experiences at the core for people. But today, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're working with brands and helping them understand culture in a way that's very intimate and connected. We're helping them understand audiences, whether it's through the research we're able to help them do in a way that's like more connected because our teams reflect the people that we're speaking with, right? Whether it's being in that environment or whether it's being, like you say, in media and the connecting of worlds, the connecting of people, the connecting and bridging the gap and saying, hey, here's this and here's this. How do we share some understanding here? Um, And there doesn't need to be a, a right or wrong answer. A lot of the times, just the conversation and the fact that people are being heard can be transformational. It's what we need more of right now. As you can see, you know, there's high tension everywhere because we're saying there needs to be this or there needs to be that. There can be a presence of, of more than one thing. We can, have more, uh, we can have more than one right answer on something. So do you know where you're going next or is it more, I have this incredible toolbox that I've built. I'm learning how to say yes to some things, no to others. And therefore I'm gonna let the universe be part of my destiny versus you dictating where you go next? I don't know that. I think every day is a gift, to be honest. And so I try to lead with, obviously you have direction that you wanna to go to. So you, you, you know, you're, you're living intentionally to go in that route. You have visions and dreams and goals. So you're, you're leading in that way, but there is some magic that happens around that. And I've always said that, um, you have to stay active in order for the universe and the, like, the magic to happen. It has to find you, but it's not going to find you if you're kind of, you know, nestled in the corner waiting for it. It doesn't seek you out. You have to be out there busy, and then the opportunities are going to come because you're busy and you're intentional with that. We put people in the Hall of Fame in Major League Baseball for hitting the ball two or three times out of every 10 times at bat. Like they get paid millions of dollars to fail seven times out of 10. So I think it's important for us to take that analogy and that lesson and approach our days with that. We're all going to fail at some things, but we all have the choice to try. You might not get that, you know, goal that you have, but you definitely won't get it if you don't try. Do you feel your mom's still with you? Every single day. Yeah. Every, every single day. I mean, um, Every single day. And I'm not the only one who has lost somebody. You know, we, we lose people and we will continue to lose people. But I, I was lucky enough to see somebody trying every day. Yes, you're going to have those moments where you need to just check out for a couple of days and just take some time and regroup. And I do that. You know, I remember a, a, a story that my mother told me. She said, listen, when I was old enough, she said, sometimes when you guys go to school, I used to just take a time out for like the day. And when you got back, I was ready for you, but I took a time out and I gave myself, I said, I'm going to take two days like that. But on day three, 
we're back at it. I think we need to give ourselves more self-care and therapy. We need to understand when we need to time out and regroup. Does she still want you to be prime minister? She didn't say she wanted me to. She said, if you want to, you could be. He wouldn't, he'd make a pretty good prime minister. No, right? no, 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 no. Anyway, anyway. So no, no. I, I always end my, my uh, show with my three takeaways. And I've always believed that in life, there's three kinds of rewards. There's intellectual rewards. I'm learning and I'm feeling great about it. There's emotional rewards. And then there's financial rewards. And I think a lot of people I've met in my journey are consumed by their financial rewards. And I think what I love about you, Jesse, is you lead with your heart. You have a great capacity with your intelligence. You have a credible bias for action. And because of that, you're successful. So you're, you just are one of these people that really are an old soul and lead. Second thing is I love the way you talk about your journey as zigging and zagging. You have to put yourself out there. You have to put yourself out there opportunities will come. And I think the third part of my takeaway is you don't just put yourself out there. You talk to the cashier. You talk to the receptionist. You talk to anybody and everybody you see because they're human beings and they matter to you. And I think because of that, this concept of you being a connector makes an awful lot of sense to me. And I'm glad we connected and I'm glad you're on Chatter That Matters. So thank you for joining me. Yeah, no, I appreciate this. And I thank everybody for making the time. I I came up in marketing uh, looking at this guy, admiring everything he was doing and saying, you know, man, at some point I'd love to like connect with him just to be here. I mean, many, many years later and sharing space and time with you on your podcast, it just kind of shows like there's no real time on things, but live in the intention and you just never know how it's going to come about. And so uh, this is huge. I think Jesse deserves an incredible round of applause. Mm, thanks. So we got a couple other things we want to do. I want Sherry, Sherry Wurhan's going to come up from uh, Sheridan because I wanted to put context in terms of what is the role of the educational system within this changing world. To me, I find that when you're in an institution that has the flexibility and the energy to change, you're in a special place. And I, Jerry, when I first met you on, on, and I was, you know, we were just having a great conversation, the three of us, and you kept tugging your hair, say, sorry, I get excited. I move, touch my hair. And, and then I looked at your resume and I'm really not going to read your resume because it's too long. I'm just going to say what I loved about your toolbox, basing on Jesse, you've come through so many parts of the educational system from teaching, educating, working with faculty. Mm -hmm. And today you're really part of change. I have the privilege to work with others to help them discover their fullest potential. So when I listen to Jesse and I hear about heart, how can Sheridan, how can education be that? And it's inherent in Jesse's journey, right? These moments of self-connection and self-reflection where he's pausing to connect with himself. And I think the ways in which higher education, I, I do feel right now that there's a calling for higher education to do this uh, across the world right now uh, within the top three skills. So 3,100 recruiters surveyed within the top three, self-awareness and resilience, right? So in addition to digital you know, evolution, we're seeing this need for humans to develop this. And so I think what higher education needs to do, and it's something that we're trying to do here with a lot of heart and passion, is to focus on the whole student. There's so much emphasis on technical development, right? So you come to college or university, develop these technical skills that you need to, right? So you want to be a nurse and you, or you want to be an architect, and so you develop those skills. But the only way you're going to be able to express those skills with confidence in the arena out there is if you're developing what we like to refer to as these self-preservation or self perseverance skills or self-evolution skills. But so what I understand that in schools nowadays, everybody passes 
The average is often in the 90s, so they can get into a university. Everybody gets a medal for showing up. What do we do as an education to say it's okay, it's okay to roar? With advances in AI and advances in tech, there's so many ways in which we're living in a culture where things are supposed to be faster and we're supposed to be able to do things faster. But what the research shows and the science shows and what Jesse shows us is, is that we need to develop these practices on how to know how to pause in the race. Because it's actually, you know, pausing and being able to connect with the self and being able to reflect, that's what drives agility and resilience. It's not, you know, faster and harder. The cars we're in right now that take right. gas or electric, um, you actually do need to do what? You got to maintain it, right? Charge them. You got to charge them. You got to take them in. You got to, you got to pause for a bit. And when you do that, you're able to, there's this moment of actually going like, we need to fuel this thing back up. The creative process isn't one that's straight, right? It's filled with these turns. And I, I think you mentioned earlier, zigs and zags, right? In order to persist, you have to be able to pause. You have to be able to navigate the complexity. You're not going to be able to know how or what to do next if you don't pause. Do you think it's possible that schools like Sheridan in the next five years will disrupt Ivy League schools because you're approaching it, you have the flexibility and speed and appetite, and you're willing to risk more than maybe something sitting with a $15 billion endowment and, and an alumni that sort of says that's the way we do things? I think the beauty of Sheridan is number one, their uh, investment in programs like what we're doing right now with Essence that is focused on these human capacities. Um, that's huge. You know, this program was developed with close to 200 students, staff, and faculty who've contributed to it. Everyone has an opportunity to get in the mess of the creative process. Yeah, Sherry Warhan, thank you for joining me in Chat of the Matters. I think another round of applause. And awesome. we'd love to open it up to some questions and answers. So far away. Uh, my name is Parveen. I'm here with my daughter, Simran. I want to get deeper into the internal motivation to get there. Like everybody's got that burning desire. You have ideas, they have skills, right? But you're in a situation where you're in a family where there's lots of challenges. Your parent, who's trying to be supportive, may have other challenges and trying to survive. Of course. You're in a community that doesn't agree with maybe how your child identifies, says 100%. you can't get a job like that, yep. and everything is bad, bad, negative, and you ask for help, and then there's wait lists and things, right? So you're always trying to prove that you matter. So coming home to that noise every day, what would be, like, I believe, like, small changes can create huge impact. Yeah. But it's got to start inside you, right? Yeah. What advice would you give to young people right now to say, I know it's hard. I know maybe no one believes in you or everybody just feels like they want you to be safe. Go get a nine to five job, right? What would you say to them to not be scared and just do it anyways? If the thing that you're going after matters to you, if it lights you up, then it's worth standing in the batter's box and swinging as many times until you hit. And so that's why I always talk about uncovering what we're passionate about, really understanding like what are the things that light us up that move us? Because I feel like you'll really stand in there and try to figure that out. There's going to be a rough road when you take that path though, right? Like it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be what they show on social media that someone does something and overnight it's a big success. But is it is that is that really what it's about, right? Like, is it is it not about the journey? I think fear is a great thing. Fear is not something to to be nervous about. I think when you allow other people who want you to fail, that's permission to fail, because and a lot of people want you to fail because you're not like them, or there's so many negative circumstances. I just lost my job. I don't know. Forty percent of Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck. It's tough out there. How am I allowed to dream? That doesn't, I don't have permission to dream because the people around me are dreaming. They're barely surviving. And I think that's what's hurting our country right now. And I just tell you, if you've got a dream, write it down.
Start journaling it. Start manifesting. See yourself. What are you going to be like in three years? What is it going to mean to you? Why is that going to matter? And keep moving towards it. As Jesse said, even if you keep failing, no one's judging you but yourself. And if you're just, you know, you want to be a songwriter and you start with just scraps of, of, of words on a, on a napkin, you might write Lose Yourself. Your internal fear is motivation, allowing other people to want you to fail or, or to say you're not allowed to succeed. That's what's going to hold you back. And that's the hardest thing in the world. That's the switch I wish I could figure out in life because there's so many people that when you finally start talking to them on my podcast, they, they talk about their dreams and what they believed in and how it just kept going further and further away. I, I think that's the magic of humanity, man, when you can find a way to overcome that. Joining me for the second time on Chatter That Matters, and she will be here many more because I just absolutely love what Jody Wright has to say. She is the Senior Director of Youth and Young Adult Client Segment Strategies. Jody, welcome back to Chatter That Matters. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure to be here. You did this study, and then you repeated the study 10 years later that talks about how young people are feeling about money. So what I'd love you to do, and I'm asking you to do this on the spot, but I, I believe a lot in head, heart, and hands, how people think, how they feel, and their, and then for how they act. So in terms of how they're thinking about, was there any major changes? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that had changed the most was how they approach their post-secondary education and where they're living. And so if we compare to 10 years ago, only about a third of um, students who were at post-secondary education were living at home, whereas now that's about a half. And what was also interesting is that we asked you know, kind of how you feel like you're going to be taking care of your financial needs. And uh, 10 years ago in 2013, about a quarter assumed that their parents would, would help them take care of their financial needs. And now again, almost a half are assuming that. So I, I think there's a couple things here. One is a change in the economic environment, you know, with inflation and the rising cost of, of living and, um, tuition costs and everything that's sort of contributing to that is, is what's driving a number of students to, and their families, quite frankly, to look at ways to be able to continue to have that post-secondary experience and the importance of that education, but doing so in a way that's going to not be as costly. And so that means living at home. That means, you know, still taking on some debt. And I can talk a little bit about some changes that we did see decade later with respect to a debt, the debt, um, that students take on. Um, but at the same time, I think that this generation is a little bit more self-aware and is more willing to kind of admit what they don't know. Um, so, you know, the vast majority in this, in this survey admitted that they are not good at handling money. They, they said that they're much better at spending than saving and they still have a lot to learn about finances. And that was a shift from a decade late, a decade ago, rather. But I, I'm not sure whether in fact, they are worse at handling money, or maybe they're just more willing to say that they're not as um, as aware and as financially literate as they as they could be and as they want to be. Jody, your, your organization just launched My Money Matters, which is sort of this hub where it's not a place to buy anything; it's a place to learn and to to get more experience when it comes to money matters. Is this something that you're encouraging young people to go to, or is this, is my money matters more targeting people that are, you know, establishing households or, you know, navigating life? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd say it's for everybody. The my money matters, I think is a phenomenal, what we call sort of a digital destination. It brings comprehensive content resources, a bunch of tools and calculators together in, in, in one place. Cause we had all of this before, but it was kind of disparate and it would be in different areas of our, of our website. And so we thought, Hey, we need to bring this together. Well, of course, we do have things like retirement and um, parenthood and, you know, things that that might be more for um, for older individuals or individuals that are not, you know, just uh, newly graduates or in their teens. But at the same time, we also have saving for a first home and overall budgeting tips. And, you know, how do you how do you leverage debt properly? Like how do you use a credit card properly? Cash flow management. Like, so there's so much in there that I'd say it's really for everyone. Um, at the same time, we do have a separate 
student hub uh, that we call it. It's rbc.com slash students. And that's where we, we really target and specify the information that's specifically for individuals that are at that life stage. So I, I would really encourage people to to consider both um, as they're they're looking to build up their financial literacy. I've been hearing about our lack of financial literacy across all ages for at least a decade. Are we moving the needle? And if not, what is it going to take? Because to me, you know, the old adage, money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you choices. I think the choice to be more responsible with the money I have has got to lead to a better outcome. We are getting better. And I believe that it requires, um, you know, a number of different pillars to be stood up and to actually function properly. So one would be, would be government and, um, the, the school systems and, and what we have as part of our, um, our curriculum. You know, I think back to my own high school experience and there was nothing in financial literacy there. Whereas I look at my kids, I have a 12 year old and a nine year old and they're already learning about it, not just in, in math and around, you know, things like interest and, um, and from a mathematical perspective, but even around financial literacy and around budgeting and debt management and, and things that become more, um, sophisticated as, as, as kids age. And so that needs to be even more of a, an ongoing Going trend that we see in our education. Secondly, um, I really believe that financial institutions like RBC, as I mentioned before, have this fiduciary responsibility to really promote this financial literacy. And so it's a big focus of ours. It's always been a focus of ours. I mean, we've got a lot of great resources. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, Tony, we partnered with McGill University to put together a a free online sort of self-led um, program that's that's led by or taught by by McGill professors. And and so it's it's always been part of our DNA. Um, but I think we need to continue to do more. And that's what we're really striving to do. Well, Jody, I am hoping that you will come back and uh, and offer us uh, more advice in the future. I would love that. I'd be be happy to come anytime you'll have me. Chatter That Matters has been a presentation of RBC. It's Tony Chapman. Thanks for listening, and let's chat soon.